Everyone here knows you yes. so well. I will not read well, your long list of awards. Don't introduce. No introduction. Why bother? I agree. Everyone knows you. So, you know, we're home. You're amongst friends. Yes. yes. Hmm? So. Okay. video and, and magnetic separation and so uh, it's really impressive the, the breadth of things that, that Alan's involved in. I won't read his long biography. I think all of you know more about him and he's well known to everyone here and uh, um, but his long list of slides is particularly impressive so um, won't read it. We, yeah that would that would bore everyone unless you have a strange place but uh, but thank you for giving me this this seminar. Right. This is an as you all know, I think an important breakthrough, and, and so the research presented today is one of the really big highlights coming out of, of being in ECSB. So, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, John. I always find the uh, most difficult place to give a seminar is at home. in front of all your friends and most of the people know a lot about it already anyway. But I'll do it and please let's be informal and uh, interrupt me anytime. Ask questions. I'm, gonna, I'm going to be telling you about uh, solar cells, uh, organic solar cells, OPV, organic photovoltaic, using this uh, bulk header junction phase separated uh, concept for generating the charge and extracting it. We had, uh, as I think many of you know, uh, focus primarily, not primarily, exclusively on, uh, on using polymers as the uh, donor component in the bulk heterojunction structure. There had been, of course, work with uh, some small molecules, uh, vapor deposited small molecules. I give Full credit and, and acknowledgement to, uh, to Guy Bazan for suggesting, maybe even insisting, that we try a small molecule, soluble small molecules, 
as the uh, as the donor component. And full credit and thanks to Greg Welsh, who's right here, uh, for synthesizing these molecules. The device fabrication and analysis was all done by Yemi San and Wei Lin, Wei Lin Long. Right over here. Chris Takas, uh, very uh, insightful, very clever use of uh, high resolution phase contrast TEM to look at the, uh, at the structure, microstructure. Lauren Cake for ultra fast spectroscopy. Uh, we've been discussing the results until about 15 minutes ago. So, so some of these things are, uh, are very new. This is a seam project, but of course other sources of support uh, contributed particularly to the uh, fabrication and, and the device analysis uh, from, from, from AFOSR. Why organic photovoltaics? Why OPP? Well, they're thin, they're flexible, they're lightweight, they're rugged. You've seen them. High throughput because of, of, of roll to roll manufacturing, and that implies the potential for low cost and, and low carbon footprint. I'll show you some numbers on that later. Unique uh, semi transparent modules with tunable colors. We can put the windows, we can put them. We foresee putting them in windows, putting them on the facades of buildings. And this has already started uh, uh, demonstrations of, of this sort of thing. I'll show you s uh, some photographs. And finally, uh, it's remarkably interesting and challenging science, concept of nanoscale photovoltaics and how you go from the nanoscale to the, to the uh, macro are some of the things that have us uh, fascinated. One of the points that you should take from that little set of highlights is that we're really not competing with silicon. Things I I, uh, I list here are basically things that silicon cannot do. Of course, we're trying to reach the highest efficiencies that we can, and uh, in the middle of the night, uh, when I'm up with a whiskey. I think about the possibility that we can actually get to 20%. And I think from a point of view of, of the uh, basic scientific understanding, that's possible. I'll try to give you some insight into uh, what we have to do uh, to do that. So this is a new direction for the SEAM project, making bulk heterojunction solar cells with small molecules. Some of the motivations, chemists complaining. With polymers, there's a inherent batch, batch to batch variations in solubility, molecular weight, polydispersity, et cetera, et cetera. That might not be true when you really get to large scale manufacturing. But in the, it, at this stage of the game, 
when one is trying to understand the relationship between structure and properties, uh, trying to understand the, uh, to evaluate, as I said here, the uh, fundamental structure, structure performance relationships, this kind of batch to batch variation uh, is painful, hard to learn. So they came up with this uh, molecule, set of molecules, or a whole set of molecules, like as you can see, that is a molecule. Small, uh, yes, but not so small. I mean, as you can see, the uh, there's ten heterocycles there, alkyl chains. Uh, so a fairly large small molecule, but it nevertheless a small molecule. And it is soluble. And the spectrum, which I show down below, of the red, goes out to beyond 800. Now, that's not really far enough to get it all. As you know, there's still a lot of, uh, of radiation, solar radiation coming in at longer wavelengths, but this isn't bad for a start. And as I'll show you, uh, this, this, this system is able to give uh, interesting initial results. Uh, I, I quote this figure 6.7%, but it's above 7% now as they continue to, uh, to optimize uh, the uh, fabrication of the cells. I have shown this diagram many times, but let's, let's get all on the same wavelength. We start with the system, of course, in its ground state. Photons come in. Photons cause uh, a transition from the ground state to the excited state. Let's think about uh, a transition on the molecule. You can also, of course, have transitions on the fullerene. If you have transition on the molecule, then you will transfer electrons. And if you, have trans if you, if you photo excite the, the fullerene, you'll transfer holes. The final, final state is the same. And the sequence of events is that, of course, this is basically instantaneous. The time scale for that optical transition is something like 1 over the energy, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Basically, for all practical purposes, instantaneous. The creation of mobile carriers in this phase separated structure shown schematically here and I'll show you real real data uh, in a few minutes but you know what I mean I think uh, the black here is supposed to be a network of the fullerenes and the white is supposed to be a network of the of the donor and I want to I want to photo excite and transfer electrons from the molecule to the, to the fullerene. And then I would like to get them out uh, to produce energy. Unfortunately, I can't get them all out, at least not yet, because there are perhaps traps. There is. Uh, intrinsic uh, biomolecular recombination. So the, the challenge is to get the internal field relatively high and to get 
the mobile carriers to be mobile. That is to say, to have a sufficiently high mobility that we can sweep them out to the external circuit to make electricity before they recombine. This is the way it works. And that happens, that process of um, photo excitation, instantaneous, 50 femtoseconds. There have been a lot of studies of, uh, of that time scale. Uh, the initial discovery of this ultra-fast photo-induced electron transfer was, uh, was made here in 1992. Uh, we didn't have that resolution at the time, but we, knew, but we were able to show that uh, the charge transfer was ultra fast uh, and that occurred at time scales well under a picosecond. So charge, light comes in, you get electron hole separation. And the electrons are on, as I said, on, on the uh, Fullerene network and the holes are on the donor network and if everything goes well, they can be pushed out to the electrode. So for this uh, small molecule that I showed two or three slides ago, uh, first question is, is it, a, is it a decent material? Is it a reasonable material? Can we hope uh, to be able to uh, extract the carriers? And so here are some uh, FET data. The uh, transconductance analysis gives you a gives you a hole mobility of about 0.1, which isn't bad uh, for, for for these kinds of systems. Uh, you'll see, I think, why uh, it is reasonably high and why we think maybe we can make it higher. But just from a quick glance at this, it, this is a reasonable candidate. Mobility is high enough that we can sweep the carriers out and, uh, and get 70% efficiency. We were surprised in the initial experiments because of the small amount of fullerene that is required to optimize the performance. Typically, in the past, when we were using polymers, and I know of no, no, I know of no uh, exception, uh, at least 50-50, and typically two or three times more of the donor than the fullerene acceptor to get optimum performance. Here, with this system, we're the best performance is 70-30. Uh, so, only 30% of the, of the material is, is the donor, is the acceptor. Why what sets that ratio? I don't know. Why is it that here we only need 30% but in other cases, I don't know. These things, of course, self-assemble. We don't make them. The phase separation occurs spontaneously. And we find that only 30% is required. Unusual. Uh, Interesting, uh, but
but the self-assembly is, is, is not well understood and, and we don't really have control. But in this case, a relatively small amount of fullerene is sufficient uh, to optimize the device performance. These are data from uh, James Rogers, kind enough to provide it, and Ed Kramer's group. So James, uh, in collaboration with Ed and, and, and Guy, did uh, TEM tomography on uh, this system. In order to do TEM tomography, basically what you do is you take a thin film and you do transmission electron microscopy and then you tilt the sample and this way and this way and you very carefully try to keep the center fixed. And you take advantage of something since the both materials are largely carbon. Contrast is, uh, is, is a difficult issue. But in, in the TEM tomography, the, they use the energy loss from the plasmon of the fullerene to give contrast. And you can see here, this is, this, this is basically a top-down image. Uh, it's not three-dimensional. Uh, I've seen, three seen it in, you know, in, in three dimensions. But that's going from the top to the bottom. There are a lot of pathways uh, of the fullerene, which go from the top to the bottom. So there is more or less well-defined phase separation and, and, and pathways for charge transport across the film. With this kind of tomography, one can really go in and look at the details, analyze it in, you know, at any level you want. This is the uh, IPCE spectrums. Uh, basically, how many electrons do you get out per photon in? Not per photon absorbed. Just shine light. How many electrons do you get? And as you can see, only about 50%. So that 7% solar cell should be able to uh, give us 12, 13%, whatever. If we could improve the mobility so that we would uh, get a larger fraction of the electrons out. That's one of the biggest challenges. The spectrum is understandable in terms of the spectrum of the absorption, but you don't get them all out. We have uh, attempted over the last couple of years not to not to control, we'd love to control uh, the morphology of the phase separation, but to uh, affect it with processing additives. And this bizarre compound, diiodo-octane, works marvelously well as a, a processing additive. As you can see here, uh, not well coded. Oh, it's coded here, right. If you don't put any uh, of the additive in and just cast the film, you get relatively poor performance. 
but when you go up to 0 0.2 or 0 0.25 uh, percent of the additive, you actually have done something significant uh, to, the, to the structure. I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, I gave a lecture at, at uh, chemistry department at Berkeley last Tuesday. And someone had the audacity to ask me why diiodo octane? <laughs> I said, look, I, I was educated as a physicist. I was born as a physicist. My sons tell me I look like a physicist. I became a chemist on October 13, 2000. I haven't the faintest idea why DIO, DIO really works. But we discovered it in, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, again in collaboration with the Bazan group. But this is particularly unusual. Uh, in the past, this additive to the solvent uh, was in the range of three or four uh, percent. It's a high molecular, high uh, boiling point uh, solvent additive. Uh, when uh, when all is done, it's gone. Uh, it evaporates out. But in the process, it changes the morphology. Improves the uh, the performance. And as I said, we're now up, up above a little above 7%. And th these are quite remarkable values. Uh, there's been a lot of work. We're not the first uh, to use small molecules in OPB. Uh, typically, uh, that was done by vapor deposition of the small molecules. In this case, the molecules were designed to be uh, soluble. And uh, these are very impressive results. Uh, reasonably high open circuit voltage, good fill factor. Uh, not good enough, but good, e but, but good. In the, in the blend, in the bulk heterojunction material, as you can imagine from looking at that, at that image I showed a moment ago of the uh, PEM tomography, the pathways are convoluted. The uh, mobility is not as high as in the pure uh, in the pure materials, but they're not. But it's not bad. Uh, the mo hole mobility and the electron mobility are nearly balanced here, which is good because you don't want to have phase charge effects. And the value is between ten to the minus two and ten to the minus three. I commented that that leads to a, a result where we have. 50, 60 percent IPCE. It's an electric field driven device. <coughs> and basically get drift mobility from the internal field that comes about from the different, uh, from photo excitation uh, separating the Fermi levels of the donor part and the acceptor part. So if we could increase the mobility not by a factor of 1,000, not by a factor of 10, but by a factor of a few, we would be able to get that IPCE up to 80 90%, and we would be very happy. This is the. Uh, 
the TEM image that I referred to from that Chris uh, Takas provided. What he's done here is uh, use phase contrast uh, TEM with high resolution. And you can see the crystals. These are the crystal planes. To me, that's a, a remarkable image because uh, near, nearly that whole area is covered with, with crystal. And all of those crystals have the, the planes the way you see them. In some cases, they're oriented this way, someplace else this way, someplace else this way, someplace else this way, etc. And what Chris did to try to, to uh, show that is to color code. So uh, yellow is that orientation, and red is, well, you get the idea. But I don't understand why all these crystals seem to be, ha have the same uh, face up. We're looking all the way through the film. Some of those crystals are near the top, some near the bottom, some in the middle. You can't, can't really tell. That's a 50 nanometer scale bar. The in-plane stacking is uh, about 2 nanometer despacing. Uh, that probably means that the width of this is the length of that molecule. It's about what uh, the, uh, the, it, it, that's about the length of the molecule. And since this is a, a, a phase contrast image, the uh, molecules are, are the dark region and the space between them is the white region. And it seems that they're stacked. In crystal structure actually has been done in detail. They're sort of banana shaped, as you know. And the way the crystal structure works is that they stack like this. But that go has good enough pi pi stacking that transfer of electrons down through it is moderately good. The mobilities are moderately good. This is these. Uh, this image was taken without any of this uh, uh, DIO additive. Uh, I don't want to go into this in detail, but the important thing is that when you go out of phase. Uh, uh, out of focus, uh, you essentially put a filter in, case-based filter, which is called the contrast transfer function. And what Chris did was to make certain that he set it up so all the power spectrum was in a window of that contrast transfer function. As a result, uh, that's a real image of the crystal plane. Now, optimize. As you saw, you may not remember, but with 0.25% of this DIO additive, the efficiency went up dramatically. 
can still see the crystals. Uh, typically, they're somewhat smaller. And the plane is no longer uh, fully covered, tiled by those crystals. These gray regions are regions where it, it looks amorphous or tilted away so that you don't see uh, sharp uh, well-defined structure. Just how that makes the cell better is not really understood. Um, well, we, um, we were very excited with these results, 7% right off the bat, new uh, idea, new molecules, wrote the paper, ready to send it off to uh, Nature Materials. And then came the second batch from our friends, the chemists, and the efficiency was lousy, 1% instead of 7 is one of the most interesting uh, interactions that I've seen in a long time. It's a bit stressful. What the hell is going on? Because Greg was sure of his chemistry. And Yan Ming and Wei Lin were sure that they knew how to make their devices. And so they, you know, not fight, but, and it, w it took a while. It took a while. They figured it out. It turns out that in the, uh, in the synthesis of, of this molecule, there is a step last step where you're trying to put this group onto the rest of it which you've already made and unless and if the conditions are not right instead of putting this group on you put a methyl group on um, hadn't been realized and it was very hard to find, less than 0.2%. But they did, finally, uh, through mass spectroscopy, and then, then even NMR, uh, figure out that the existence of uh, something less than 0.2% impurity was sufficient to uh, really screw up the device. Now, um, this, this shows you that, but the, the words are clear. We had, last year, uh, purposely introduced uh, traps into one of our favorite polymer systems uh, using the C84 uh, derivative of, of the uh, PCBM instead of PC70, PC84. We know that the uh, PC84 LUMO is about 0.35 EV below the uh, PC70. And it just, it just kills the performance uh, here at one part per thousand, you can already see uh, the effect. At one part per hundred, uh, it's, it's dead. Very similar kind of thing with the uh, small molecule that I just showed you, a uh, fraction of a percent. On the one hand, we should not be surprised. We should know that 
semiconductor devices are very sensitive to, to purity for the last 50 years. But somehow in this, uh, in this area, people haven't really paid enough attention to, to this issue of purity. In my opinion, there are many examples in the literature where people work very hard to synthesize a new polymer, for example, uh, obtained moderately good or maybe not even that, maybe poor results, and put it on the shelf and went on to make yet another uh, synthesis of, of a new, new uh, a new polymer or a new molecule. I think in many cases, uh, one should be suspicious that the modest performance that they obtained was not because the polymer wasn't any good. This is because it wasn't pure enough. So I hope that these two examples will be sufficient to, uh, uh, to heighten people's awareness of the need for purity and even stimulate uh, people to go back and uh, clean some of these things up and see to what extent uh, there are improvements. So back to this first uh, diagram that I showed you. This is particularly interesting. It's, it's bothered me for nearly 15 years uh, that you can get charge separation, photo-induced charge separation, time scales of 50 femtoseconds. That's a thousand times faster than the first step in photosynthesis. And here we just have this simple two-component system. Not only is it, is it a thousand times faster, but it's basically irreversible, very asymmetric. The forward rate, as I said, is about 10 to the 14th, and the backward rate is many, many orders of magnitude slower. Uh, in photosynthesis, in order to prevent the back charge transfer, nature had to make a whole series of acceptors to, to keep moving the electron and the hole apart. Here, because of basically distortion on the molecule, when the, an electron goes on the fullerene, uh, it's like putting a belt around it. Well, it's polaron. And the uh, polaron essentially creates a barrier for back transfer. But why is it so fast? And how fast is it? So these are the, these are ultra-fast spectroscopy data from, uh, from Lauren, Lauren Cake. You see two features. You see here bleaching of the transition. Of course, if you have excited all the molecules, then you can't excite any more. So the absorption goes down. So you get a negative uh, change. It becomes more transmissive what, because the ground state is depleted. The charge transfer creates a polaron, and that has a characteristic spectrum here. And you're looking at several different uh, time delays following the uh, excitation pulse. But let's, let's look a little more closely. And what you see here is I think beautiful and, uh, and remarkable. This, this bleaching uh, happens basically instantaneously. You 
this is this is the time scale of the transition. And here is a plot of that bleaching signal versus time in in the sub picosecond regime, and you can see that that happens really fast. And by the way, this is uh, determined by the temporal resolution of the of the system by the pulse width. So, by using, by knowing that this is really supposed to be a, a vertical straight line, instantaneous, one can, in one can one can infer the pulse width, and one can use that to analyze how fast the charge transfer occurs. Right away, without doing anything, you see this very surprising uh, result that by putting in a very, again, the 0.25% of the fast, actually fast, and when Lauren took that apart. The uh, pure system has charge transfer in about 60 femtoseconds. Um, as you put the uh, DIO in, making these subtle changes, it gets significantly faster. Now, of course, the error bars are are, are significant because one is deconvoluting, but it goes down to less than 20, <coughs> less than or, or, or order 20 femtoseconds. Now, the question is, the length scale of this phase separation uh, is of order 20 nanometers, 10 nanometers. Uh, how do you get charge separation in that extremely short time scale? Bothered us for a long time. So here's an idea. Let me use this one first. If you have a potential, look at the potential on the left. There are bounds there. And that particular potential, as, as, as sketched by Lauren, has uh, one, two, three, four, five bound states. But then, for uh, electrons at higher energies, uh, they're not bound. As they, I mean, the wave functions are phase shifted but they're running waves. Now, in the case that I'm talking about, that we're talking about, one has an interface, a header junction. And you can certainly imagine that at that header junction, you could have an electron on one side, on the hole inside, and a hole on the other side. And the Coulomb interaction between them would cause them to form a bound state, an exciton, a charge transfer exciton. Now, the interface is, is the key here. Everything is tied to the interface. There's a potential. It's a two, it's an electron in a hole, and they form a bound state. In fact, typically excitons have several bound states, but there are going to be continuum states, a continuum of non bound states, of states which are not localized. 
but are in some sense tied to the interface. So there will be a density of states, uh, two particle states, that die off, probably exponentially, I don't know, as you go away from that interface. And that uh, continuum could provide the pathway for ultra-fast electron transfer. Got to explore that in more detail, but it's the first idea that really seems to have the potential to give rise to this ultra-fast charge transfer. People had argued, for example, that uh, an exciton is formed in the donor and it has to diffuse to the interface at which point it, uh, it is separated by the, by the heterojunction, but it, it, it simply makes no sense at all. Uh, exciton diffusion is slow. And we had a postdoc last year who did some beautiful experiments that showed that the electron transfer actually had occurred before the exciton was even formed. Now, what happens here is, is shown here. Very quickly, we form these, the, the charge transfer in 20, 30 femtoseconds. And then Lauren watched it as a function of time. As it decays, as the amplitude decays, you're, you're, simply, count, you're simply measuring the density of, uh, of, of polarons, the density of mobile carriers. And you can see here that at, at high uh, input power, where the number of electrons and holes is very high, and where you would expect, therefore, bimolecular recombination to be, to be particularly important, uh, you lose a lot of carriers in the first nanosecond. As you turn the power down, this gets smaller and smaller. Even here, we're about two to three orders of magnitude higher in carrier density than is the case uh, for the solar cell. So the bimolecular recombination is getting weaker and weaker. If you go down still farther in intensity, what you find is that you can't even see the, the bimolecular decay. That jump occurred, bring the uh, charge separation. But then interestingly enough, uh, and to my surprise, there is another process, a slow process, that takes uh, something of order 100 picoseconds. And that could well be a diffusion of, uh, of excitons to the interface. The dominant process is the, is the ultra-fast process, something like 80-90%. But uh, this can be interpreted as, uh, as arising from exciton diffusion to an interface. OK, so we have um, some understanding or some conjectures uh, as to why the charge transfer is so fast. Now I've got electrons and holes separated with very high efficiency because it's so because the process is so fast. There's nothing that competes with it. Uh, photoluminescence 
decay times are typically hundreds of picoseconds, whereas this is 50 femtoseconds, you know, many, many orders of magnitude faster. So the quantum efficiency for charge separation is, is nearly 100%. The trick is to get them out. And we discovered last year something which in a way is, is obvious, uh, that you have to sweep the carriers out before they recombine if you want to generate electricity. So these are some data were obtained by Sarah Cowan, who is now at the uh, NREL. And what I'm showing you here is that as you apply a, an external voltage, uh, you reduce the internal voltage. Uh, and when you get finally to an external voltage which is close to the built-in potential, then there's very little uh, field to drive the carriers out, and a, a lot of the decay is uh, from recombination. But at zero external voltage, when only the built-in potential is driving the carriers, the sweep out time is faster than the recombination. Not quite fast enough because the mobility is not quite high enough. I showed you that. The IPCE is 60% is, is 60 so I would like to have a higher mobility so I could bring that, uh, bring at short circuit, I could bring the carriers out uh, at nearly 100% without recombination. It was one example of that where we got all the carriers out, and every one of the carriers uh, reached the electrode. So it's possible. But that's the trick. That's what, we have to, that's what we have to do better. Now, it's not just a question of the mobility. It's a question also of the morphology because if you have a convoluted pathway, it's more difficult to get the carriers out. Sort of obvious. This is an interesting example where we started off, as I told you, with only 30% uh, fullerene, and I was surprised that because of all our previous experience that that was the optimum point. And it's interesting to explore what happens when you go take out more and more and more of the fullerene. You still get connected pathways, even at this level. Now, it's not, a very, it's not a very good solar cell, but it tells you something about the self-organization and the spontaneous phase separation that even at these very low fullerene concentrations, that is, there is continuity across the film and you can get the charge out. Well, good place to stop. Uh, just getting started. This paper actually has appeared in Nature Materials uh, after we figured out what, what the uh, what the problems were. In a uh, taking a look at this, what happened over time. There's been significant improvement in the, uh, in the efficiency. We're up now to 10%. Uh, last week, a group from UCLA 
announced 10.6% uh, with a uh, bilayer tandem cell. Um, I think the physics is fairly clear, device physics is fairly clear. And we should be able to bring this up into the 15 to 20 percent range. That's a challenge that we have. Someone calling me. I thought that uh, being here, that wouldn't happen. So this is going to be, this is our challenge to try to increase the efficiency uh, through primarily, well, three things. Got to get the spectrum right so that you absorb as large a fraction of the solar uh, radiation as possible. That means, by the way, obviously, a, an energy gap close to that of silicon. Um, you've got to improve the mobilities in order to get the carriers out. And we need to find a way we really want to optimize to uh, control the morphology rather than just take what we get. You understand that the way these, these cells are made is to take the, the, the fullerene and the donor and mix them together in a common solvent, cast a film. And almost without exception, in, in every case, in our hands, I'm sure there are some, some cases where it doesn't work, but in every case, we find this uh, bicontinuous network with uh, continuous pathways for both electrons and holes. That's just remarkable. It's just luck. If we could control the way that phase separation occurs and get straighter pathways, whatever, we would do better. So the usual propaganda, uh, low-cost manufacturing, low-energy cost manufacturing, is all done at room temperature uh, from solutions, so there's no high temperature processing involved, no melting of silicon and a low carbon footprint. And those numbers are kind of interesting. For silicon, the uh, payback time in energy is nearly two years. Now, of course, they last 20, 25 years, but still, that's a big number. Because of the, because of the low temperature, basically printing manufacturing that is, that is being explored, it only takes two months of payback time. So that's what we hope to see. These kinds of semi-transparent, for example, uh, these kinds of semi-transparent solar cells in windows, big buildings all over the world, uh, they, they uh, will generate electricity for use in the building. They will be semi-transparent, so they will cut down the heat load and reduce the amount of air conditioning that is needed. So there are applications of this kind which are very attractive and very big markets, and they're not quite the same as for example, the silicon solar cells that I have on my roof. On the other hand, as I said before, in the middle of the night with a whiskey in my hand, uh, one thinks about getting 20%. Happy to answer questions. Say it again. Have you done the TEM tomography on the other ratios? No, they haven't yet. It, it probably will get, I mean, it'll get done, but 
not yet. So you talk about interface space. I think, I think you asked the question the wrong way around. What people usually say is that because you can form an exciton, it's a pathway for recombination and inhibits the creation of ultra-fast electron transfer. The comment that I made, the diagram that I made that really uh, Lauren Cake uh, proposed is that why do you stop thinking about that electron hole pair near the interface in its ground state? Why not think about all the excited states, a whole continuum of which are extended states? And it's those extended states which offer the possibility, the quantum mechanical states, of very fast. Now, that's a really exciting idea. And uh, I hope it's true. We'll see. Are there any problems with community separation? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, but. No, no, you're absolutely right. But, but I have trouble with that, too. And so do you. And so I just put on a little bit of stuff, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, I, and I don't have to. Uh, so I think that's not a difficult problem. You, they do need to have. They have to be protected anyway. You need to uh, limit, eliminate, but certainly limit water vapor. Uh, and so you need barriers. And uh, the UV part of that is, I think, not the hard part. The hard part is uh, getting the permeability to water vapor low enough. In fact, if you look at the, if you analyze, try to try to analyze the cost of these uh, of these solar cells, the actual active material molecules that Greg makes and the fullerenes uh, is a small fraction of the cost. Substrate is costly. The barrier films are costly. The glue is costly. Uh, the actual fraction of the cost that, that is attributable to the active materials is, is, is quite is surprisingly small. You'd rather have columns. People are thinking about that. Block copolymers organized in very nice ways uh, with columnar phases. But it's hard, hard chemistry. Hasn't been done successfully yet. So I think the, uh, there's a lot of opportunity here for for uh, you don't, we have self-assembly, but, but we need directed self-assembly. Self-assembly is uh, basically the biggest problem, you know, in this general area uh, of materials, biggest problem of the 21st century. But we need to be able to have directed self-assembly, not just random self -assembly. It's remarkable that every time we do this, we get to work. Uh, but we like to have a way to build in the structure. I mean, people have thought about, of course, obvious things would be to pattern the substrate, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, for example. 
So there are ideas around and there are people working and somebody will figure it out. Yes. No, the, the dominant effect is the same effect that always uh, gives you the built-in potential of solar cells. You charge transfer. So you have a lot of holes at the top of the valence band of the, of the donor, the homo, a homo and, and that locks the Fermi level for the holes there. And you have a lot of electrons in the LUMO, or the lowest energy uh, unoccupied level of the forty. So you lock the Fermi level there. And it's that difference in the Fermi level which gives rise to the internal, basically drives the internal field. It's more interesting than that. Um, I don't have a good diagram here, but every one of those interfaces between the donor and the acceptor is the solar cell, right? Every one of them. Nanoscale solar cell. And there are 100 billion of them in a square, whatever the number is, a square centimeter. And they're all hooked up in parallel. And that happens spontaneously. They're all hooked up in parallel. And I know that because the voltage that I get for the external voltage agrees with the energy levels that I just described for you. So somehow all the uh, donor groups are connected by the electrode or by a, by a purposely put in buffer layer. And all the uh, uh, acceptor fa uh, regime, uh, domains, are, are hooked up together and the whole thing ends up in parallel. And the field is well defined as one can tell by analyzing these uh, time-dependent measurements that I very, very briefly showed you. So they're uh, very inhomogeneous, complex structure, uh, but the field is relatively unified. Yeah, to the electrode. But you, you still can might have some kind of phase separation, and you might have some isolated domain. You might have. But most have right. the equivalent bed with the combined. Well, no, that's right. You might have dead ends, uh, and you don't want that. Of course, if you have dead ends, they will quickly fill up, and then everything will go around them. So. They're not killers, but they do give rise to recombination. Right. I guess there's a question. Your model of interface resonance continuum interface space begins to bypass the charge transfer to be universal? Yes. So everything is one charge transfer. Once you have interfaces of the right. All the systems we've looked at. I mean, all all the systems we've looked at. It's true. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>